Marvin Olasky picks it up when he points out that the word compassion means to suffer with. And, and his whole concern is that in the 19th century, it wasn't enough just to, to pay taxes. In the 19th century, you also had an obligation to give of yourself. That you had to be involved. And the true compassion didn't mean just writing the check or giving the homeless person five bucks. True compassion meant stopping and saying, why are you on the street? What can I do to help you? And in fact, deliberately not giving the five bucks until you found out how you could help them and begin the process of moving them into a better future on the premise that if you gave them the five bucks without knowing, you could actually be buying the alcohol that killed them or buying the drugs that killed them. You could actually be worsening their life by a phony compassion that really was designed to make you feel good. Uh, Morris Shekman describes it brilliantly when he says the difference between caring and caretaking. If I truly care, I have to stop and find out what's wrong. If I'm just caretaking, I do something for you that makes me feel good about myself. It may ruin you, but that's not my fault. And there's a huge difference between caring and caretaking. And in our lifetime, caretaking has driven out a lot of caring. Much of this goes back, frankly, to the very nature of the religious underpinnings and the moral underpinnings. I mean, think about, uh, first of all, the religious origins of the English Civil War, which was, which was a war over the nature of man's relationship uh, to God. Think about the notion of Wesley and Methodism and the Great Awakening. Look at the spiritual and religious underpinnings of the abolitionist movement, the sense of the progressives that they were carrying out uh, a doctrine of, of, of Christian concern, uh, that what they saw as their, help, their, their effort was, a, was bringing religion into civic life. The civil rights movement, the, the, the profound reason that it is Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., that there was a moral force, a moral basis for what he was doing. Uh, Eisenhower's description of what happened in Europe. His book is called Crusade in Europe, his statement to the troops at Normandy. We have embarked on a crusade, a religious phrase, a sense of moral superiority. The way in which we tried to do the war on poverty and the war against drugs implies that these are bad enough things to wage war on, that there's a decisive moral difference. And in fact, I would argue that there has always been a deep moralistic force in American society. And that as over the last 30 years, an anti-religious bias built into both the elite culture and, and to uh, elite institutions, it undermined and it misunderstood the core nature of the moral force. This is not about morality in the small sense of do you drink or do you dance. This is about a deeper sense. Are your commitments ultimately coming from a spiritual sense of God or is it just secular? Is that person, and again, think about it in terms of shooting or raping somebody. If you truly believe that other person has been endowed by God and is equally, legitimately, authentically a creature of God, now to attack them is a dramatically higher threshold. Whereas you think they're just randomly gathered protoplasm, and why not? I mean, blow them away. What the heck? And if you watch a lot of the sicker parts of the Hollywood elite, in terms of the movies they make and the things they describe, it's clearly man as protoplasm, human beings as protoplasm. Whereas the core belief system that made America unique was, in fact, moral and spiritual. And I would suggest it is that moral commitment which has sustained citizenship and a, and a commitment to community. That as de Tocqueville said, America is to be found in its churches and in its volunteer activities, not in its government. Now let's take just a minute and look at Jimmy Carter, who really, I think, in, in a speech he gave during the Atlanta Project process, gave us a sense of how this all weaves together into, into a basic framework. I was in a middle school long, long ago, bright kids asking me questions that were very hard to answer. Stimulating questions, questions I didn't hear anywhere else and wouldn't. Afterwards, I asked the principal, what are the main problems here? She said, Mr. President, the boys believe that their future success, their status in life is dependent upon their ownership of a semi-automatic weapon. And I said, what about the girls? She said, pregnancy is a growing problem. What you don't know is that the worst problem is among the sixth graders. I was shocked. The drug pushers and pimps prefer sex with the little girls, she said. That's not Bangladesh, and that's not Addis Ababa, and that's not Lusaka. That's Atlanta, Georgia. 
And the problem is that we don't really know how to relate to people whose 12-year-old daughters get pregnant who are living just a few hundred yards from where we live a sequestered life. It's no reflection on us, except that we need to reach out now in a genuine way individually with our stimulating capability of analyzing complicated problems and say, let me participate in bringing about a change. But you know, what gives me most hope is what I saw yesterday with homeless people building each other a little tar paper shack and the 30 formerly homeless, mostly alcoholics who are now every day preparing about 350 meals for other homeless people. That's the kind of spirit that can bind us together and rids the chasm between the rich like us and the poor who are still waiting uh, for a better life. So I'm convinced that the situation is not hopeless. I'm convinced that it's not an impossible dream. The only real failure is not to try. If I, if I could just come back and summarize this first hour for very briefly, because I, I think it is the heart of the course. America is a romantic, moral, spiritual fantasy. That's what makes us different. Take every one of us, drop us off in another country, same body, same mind, and, and say, okay, you're not endowed by your creator. You don't have a right to pursue happiness. And we would learn how to change differently. We'd, we'd behave differently. But people come from all over the world here, and they become different. They somehow cross into a magic land where everybody thinks their kids can be present. Everybody thinks their kids can be an NFL quarterback or a ballet star or could do whatever they want to do. And somehow what we have to do is come back here as we start to solve problems. What, what's, what's killed us for 30 years is trying to solve the problems down in this one box, government. And government, by definition, cannot effectively be cultural because you would have to be a police state. I mean, you, you would go nuts if government tried to do the things Alaska wants to do. You say, by what right does some paid bureaucrat tell me about these things? And yet what, what Alaska is saying is, you've got to have people involved in civic responsibility so they can then teach the right cultural values because this is the heart of America, not government. The heart of America is a, is a mystical belief that each of us is endowed by God, that each of us is unique, and then the living out of that belief to the best of our abilities. And that's what makes us remarkable. When we come back, we're going to talk about how this fits into the structure of government and politics.